Welcome back. Welcome. Um, y'all in the chat for me right now. What y'all are hoping to get out of the text get this text giving uh conference? Does Natty? I mean, does Natty Reynolds? Uh, nice to meet you as well. Hey, it's your first time. You can look forward to a great time. Uh, we are a community. We are a family. Um, so welcome to the family. And just you know, looking forward to meet you in person. Hopefully tomorrow. Um, if y'all are gonna be in person, uh, just just put your hand up like this. Put that put that emoji in the chat real quick. If y'all gonna be here in person tomorrow, y'all are gonna get to meet me. Y'all are gonna get to uh, meet Yana Jones. Y'all gonna get to meet the uh, text giving team. And in about two minutes, we are gonna get started with the uh, the first workshop of the day. Okay, perfect, beautiful, beautiful. All right, perfect, glad to meet you. Uh, all right, community opportunities and networking. Yes, indeed, we got community opportunity and networking. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and bless the stage. Now, as we tap into the fourth year of the fourth annual Thanksgiving Summit, there's no mistake that we are starting where it all began, virtually. Since the pandemic, the Thanksgiving team has been providing people looking to pivot into tech and people that are looking to upskill in tech a safe space to commute. And this year is no different. So for the next four days, we ask y'all to walk with your dreams, shake hands with your goals, and eat lunch with your aspirations. You see, no matter where you are on your tech journey, our speakers, our sponsors, and our team is here to meet you where you are and give you the tools that you need to get to the next level. Thank you for trusting us for four years as a place to commune, a safe space, to dream out loud. And you can look forward to a weekend full of community, great vibes, and helping one another lift as we climb. With that being said, welcome to the fourth annual Tech Giving Summit. Clap it up in the chat for y'all for being here today. Let's get a couple claps in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the first workshop. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Go ahead and keep clapping it up in the chat. Good morning, happy to join, I'm ready to learn. All right, it's a lot of first timers here. It's a lot of first timers here. We're glad to have y'all here today. Um, and just to introduce y'all myself, my name is Rotina Flex Vanessa at his best. I am Nana Kofi Batson. You can call me Kofi for short. I'm looking forward to meeting a lot of y'all in person tomorrow. Uh, we're gonna have a great time at Audi Field uh, and meeting some of y'all tonight as well. Now, as I meet y'all, I'm looking forward to build with y'all. Uh, I'm just gonna get the elephant out the room early. I am not in the tech industry, so I'm not a UX designer, product uh, manager, uh, software engineer. I'm none of that. But what I am is a storyteller. Just like the first person in this workshop, the first speaker of the workshop is as well. Um, and that's why I love this workshop. This workshop is going to bridge the gap between storytelling and coding. And to introduce our first speaker, he is a master communicator who understands that storytelling is a labor of love. Currently a software engineer at One Rose and also the co-founder of TextGiving. He sits at the intersection of tech and media, using his skills to push, push the culture forward in both industries. So please show some love for the co-founder of TextGiving, Mr. Femi Adebayo. Was you on mute, bro? Oh, how about now? It's good. You good? You good? You good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Text Given 2023. I'm super excited to be here. Super excited to share the stage with you guys. Um, much love to Kofi for always rocking with us year and year after. Out. Um, yeah, you know, pretty much. Let's let's get to it, man. I'm super excited. Let's do it. Um, yeah. Let me get some more emojis in the chat, man. Let me get some thumbs up, some some claps. You know, how y'all feeling right now? Let me open this up. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, uh, can you guys see my screen currently? I think it's on. Okay. You guys see the screen, right? Okay, sweet, sweet, sweet. All right, let's jump to it, right? So, 
the art of code, bridging the gap between code and story, right? The overall idea of this, 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 this presentation really is to really explore how software engineering, but, but really any technical field is, you know, not just only a technical field, but really a, a creative experience that allows you to tell stories and narratives, right? And, you know, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you know, you'll feel encouraged to, you know, take your own creative skills and apply them to a more technical space. So just a little bit about me, right? Um, born and raised in Maryland, more specifically, Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, I'm the son of uh, two Nigerian immigrants. So, you know, big love to all my Nigerians in the chat, all my West Africans and Africans in, in general. Um, I, I went to the University of Maryland College Park. I actually studied computer science, but I didn't graduate as a computer science student. Student, I actually graduated as a geographical information system student. And, you know, there's a whole story about that. Um, feel free to hit me up to learn my story a little bit more. Um, I currently work as a software engineer at Warner Bros. Discovery, uh, working specifically on media and manufacturing supply chains. And pretty much what that means is, um, you know, I basically manage and create video content, essentially, right? I'm a software engineer in the video space. And I'm also a filmmaker, right? I've been a filmmaker for six years, uh, working on weddings, uh, music videos, travel content, uh, branded content, um, and all the other things alike. And last but not least, I am the co-founder of Textgiving, right? So, you know, I'm super honored to be able to share this space with you guys um, and also honored to, to meet you guys virtually and in person as well. So if you see me around, you know, definitely say hi, definitely say what's up and uh, let's keep the party going, right? So jumping straight into the discussion points of this uh, topic, right? So first thing we're going to start off is the art of code, right? And and when I, when I say the art of code, I essentially mean that Code is not just lines, functions, classes, but actually, you know, an artistic endeavor that really challenge you to not only think critically, but creatively about the software application that you're building and writing. All right. And then, you know, we're going to jump into uh, what I like to call cinematic coding. Right. Um, really exploring just how filmmaking, you know, an inherently artistic field is, is really parallel to software engineering, something that is inherently not artistic. But again, I'll show you how that actually makes sense. And then uh, after that, we'll go into crafting your engineering story, right? And so, you know, I want to be able to kind of give you uh, what I like to call consider a five step framework of transferring your creative skills into technical ventures that not only, you know, is specific to engineering or software engineering or software development for that matter. And after that, you know, we'll conclude and, um, you know, have some time for Q&A's. Does that sound good? You rocking with me? Give me some more, some, some more emojis in the chat. Let me see what's going on. Let me see that. Let me see that energy. Okay, 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 okay. Keeping the party going, right? So jumping straight into the art of code, right? So there's a lot of ways in which, you know, we can relate programming to an, an actual artistic venture or an actual art field. But, you know, there's really three that really stand out to me. And those are the things I'm going to really take a deeper dive into. Number one is going to be what I like to call narrative and logical sequences, right? And we're going to talk about the skeleton that kind of you know, defines a narrative. What is a narrative actually, right? And we'll relate that to the skeleton of how you go about actually uh, deriving software and writing code. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna go into uh, creativity and problem solving, right? So, you know, this is just essential to any project, right? Finding unique solutions, sometimes unorthodox and unexpected solutions to problems is essential to any any uh, a software problem, but it's also critical to any story that you're writing, right? Being able to kind of take your reader or take the person that's listening to you listen to your work on the journey. And then we'll talk about craftsmanship and design, right? And not only craftsmanship as an innate skill itself, but craftsmanship as it pertains to attention to detail and attention to, you know, having a level of pride in the work that you're doing. And I'll be able to um, add a little bit of color based on the work that I do every day and to kind of show you how these concepts make a little sense for me, you know, on a daily basis. Okay, so jumping straight into it, right? Narrative and logical sequences. So what actually makes a, a narrative? What what makes a story, right? A, a narration is, is a, a sequence of characters, uh, settings, and objects that all interact with each other to, to form a sequence of events, right? It has plot twists, right? It, it takes you on a journey, but doesn't lose you, keeps you keeps you in line, and, and you know at the end gives you sort of a, a thematic resolution or something, some sort of takeaway or feeling that you can take away from you know this art piece or this narrative. Well, when we're writing software, right, what is, what is software? It's, it's a story of processes, actions, interactions, 
by using logic and structure and patterns to narrate a sequence of events, right? When we, when we think about the lines of code that we're creating, we think about the classes that, you know, sort of encapsulate or abstract, you know, code. These represent our actions <clears throat> and our characters of the story that we're building, right? They all essentially work to create a chronological sequence, right? When we think about sending requests and we think about receiving responses, there's a linear, you know, sort of uh, uh, flow to these things, right? When we think about creating uh, if statements or, or error handling, right? We're adding complexity and resolution to the overall flow of data. You know, we're not losing, you know, the plot of where we're trying to take this data or how we're trying to transform it. You know, we're keeping it in line, right? So uh, kind of going into, you know, just a little bit of like what I actually do, right? So I mentioned that I work at Warner Bros. Discovery, um, specifically on the media manufacturing and delivery supply chain, right? So kind of show you what that, that whole jargon looks like, right? So let's take a, a show, for example, um, Property Brothers on HDTV or any any Food Network show, right? Just think of any show you watch. So you may watch this on, you know, Amazon. You may watch this on uh, Roku, for example, right? Well, these different platforms have specific requirements of how they want their show to, to be transferred or how they want it to be, you know, received for their audiences, right? Whether it needs to be, whether you're watching it on mobile, so, you know, it has to be in a certain aspect ratio, or, you know, whether you're watching it on iPads, it has to be in this aspect ratio. Maybe you're watching it in a different uh, country, so they need these languages, they need um, this this audio in terms of captions, all these different things. So, you know, when, you, when we talk about the process of someone who actually producing a show to it actually being watched at the end, I sit sort of in that intersection. Right. So let's take let's talk. Let's talk about characters. Right. We have video. We have audio. We have text. These are three separate characters of this story that we're building. Right. So these all have unique traits. You know, you're not going to watch a video that doesn't have audio. You're not going to just watch a, a, a video that, that only has audio, but no, no video. Right. These all have to work together and, and form a sequence of events of being able to deliver these unique pieces together to actual deliver, which, again, is a watchable video. Keeping it going, so to dive a little bit deeper into this. Creativity and problem solving, kind of picking up on what we just landed on, right? So I want to ask you a question, like for any engineers or any, you know, product managers, anybody, have you ever worked on a feature, you know, where um, the scope of work changed later on? And and so you have to kind of change how you address the problem, or you have to kind of change your your, your approach to the problem, right? <clears throat> well, just like any, any good story, right? Code involves addressing problems and challenges, right? A lot of times through creative means and, you know, to be honest, like I said, mentioned before, unexpected means, right? And kind of piggybacking on, you know, the three characters that I brought in the last slide. So we have audio, we have video, we have text, right? Well, when you're looking at your phone and you're going to pick a, a show, right? You see a thumbnail of the show, right? So that's actually the, that's actually an image, right? So we have to actually deliver images as well when we're sending, you know, this package of, of, of content to whatever partners, right? So at work, we have um, this image repository, right? That basically is a, a storehouse of all of our images, right? So if someone needs an image, you know, Amazon needs an image, Roku, Verizon, YouTube, HBO, they need some sort of image in their package, we'll say, hey, give us this image and then we could transfer it or whatever. Well, in addition to being a, a, a image repository, this also serves as um, a way for us to resize images. So it actually has two capabilities, right? Well, as we were using this, we started to see performance issues in the service, right? Images weren't being retrieved or images weren't being resized. And that, you know, as a business, that, that means you're losing money at the end of the day. So that was the, the plot twist and the challenge that kind of came in this story that we were, you know, building, this story that we were telling, right? So if you think about creating resolutions in the story, well, what are we going to do about it? How do we get to the problem or how do we how do we get to a solution? So we thought about a few different things and we ultimately came up with, you know, the idea that to just build an in-house solution, right? Build an in-house solution that would basically take care of resizing images, you know, for whatever partner so that we can leave the, the, the task of being an image repository, image warehouse to one service and silo the, the service of resizing it to another thing, right? And when we think about a story, right, bringing it back, right, a, a story kind of addresses problems, but at the end of the day, it leaves you with a takeaway, right? It leaves you with a thing that you can take away so that, you know, when things come about the next time, you kind of know, based on previous experiences, how to, to react and how to, to move forward. Well, again, in our lesson, in this code that we were, that were writing, we after learning how to, or after deciding to silo these efforts, you know, we had takeaways now that we can use when we're building new systems, especially as it pertains to imagery, how we want to build them and how, you know, we want to silo these effort, efforts to make sure that we don't run into a lot of these same issues again. Boom, boom, boom. Keeping the party going, man. Craftsmanship and design. This might actually be 
um, my favorite uh, part of this this art of code series, right? So again, um, craftsmanship and in, in, in design is or any any artistic field is not just you know the innate skill to to do it. It's about having a level of pride in your work, right? I have a level of, of, of excellence in your work, making sure that you have a, a, a level of attention to detail, right? So the, the great uh, um, prophet, Erica Badu, you know, has a, a quote that is very near and dear to my heart, right? She says, now keep in mind, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my, you fill in the blank, right? So there, there's a level of, of pride and a level of attention to detail that goes into making art, that goes into making stories. And in the same uh, a line of thought goes into writing and creating software, right? You want to build solutions that last. You want to build applications that last the test of time, right? And again, like for any engineers or, or designers or anybody out there, right? Have you ever um, worked on a, a feature or a prod bug and you uh, realized that the bug that you were working on is something that you actually created yourself? I've definitely done that before. And I can tell you right now, it's not a great feeling, right? It, it's not a great feeling at all. So in order for us to, to be more preact proactive and not reactive, right? In order for an artist or, or someone who's creating a story to make sure that their story is inclusive and telling the the, the ultimate ultimately the, the best story possible, how do you how do you go about that? Well, you revise your story, right? You 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 revise your story over and over and you iterate over and over and you get it reviewed by peers, right? In the same line of, of software engineering and development, we we have peer review, right? We have people where you know we send our code and to make sure that we have fresh eyes and fresh experiences to make sure that, you know, the code again is robust and efficient as well. And, you know, I can, you know, relate back to uh, another time at work um, where I was working on an application where I uh, built a new endpoint and, you know, I had to decide where on the front end I wanted to make that call to the back end from. And so I had a couple ideas of where I wanted to do it. And I ultimately decided on one place where I was like, okay, this is the way it makes the most sense here. And, you know, it worked, right? And I sent it off for peer review, and I could just remember um, getting just like you know a bunch of comments on, on my uh, my review. And again, like if you've ever been, that, been in that position, you know, just seeing a bunch of comments is not a good feeling, right? You're just like, you know, I thought this is was great. I, you know, you should put this in the in the in the, in the museum or something like that. And you know, I just remember having a conversation with them, one of my, one of my coworkers, and you know, we kind of talked through, and I was able to kind of explain why I made certain decisions and why I, you know, put certain logic certain in certain places. And ultimately, you know, we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, my approach was actually the most optimal solution for, you know, the system that we're building and especially the feature that we're actually creating as well. But I can tell you um, on the flip side, right, there's instances where, you know, um, so I worked on this, this feature where for um, ads, like when you're watching the show, you know, and there's there's markers in the video that lets you know where to actually put ads, where to actually put commercials, right? So I worked on a feature where, you know, I was actually putting in the, the markers in, in our data so to show like this is where you can put ads, this is where you can put, you know, commercials, right? And I set the PR off, off for review. And, you know, I was like, man, I, I just wrote this so beautifully, right? Like you should put this code in, in the museum, to be honest, I should probably win a Nobel Peace Prize for this, right? And I could just remember um, getting the response and my my lead was just like, I don't know what this does, right? Like I this is this is hard for me to read, and you know again like this is not a good feeling to to get this. So when we when we bring it back to the story, right? Like when we when we're revising our story, a good story also is able to to foreshadow and and give context clues, right? It's not going to lose you in the narration, right? It's going to maybe take you on a journey, but it's always going to bring you back at the end of the day. So. When we think about writing code, right, we're thinking about writing code in a way where if someone was to read our code who was not us, right, or someone from, you know, maybe another team joined your team and started working on your project, or maybe, you know, you're even going to read your code a year or two years from now, you want to write it in a way that, you know, it's easy to be understand or it's easily to be understood and easy for other people to work on and help build it as well. So writing code that, you know, has a little bit of foreshadowing and, and gives context clues for other people who will be able to work on it as well. Now, one of my favorite parts, right? So this is what I like to call uh, cinematic coding, right? Um, and, you know, I want to add some, some a little bit more color. I kind of talked a little bit about what I do at work, right? But I kind of want to shift it into, you know, kind of what I do outside of work as a filmmaker and kind of tap into our creative senses. And again, ultimately show you how writing code is actually a cinematic experience at the end of the day, right? I'm a filmmaker who, who really thrives on emotion and, and creating feelings. And I don't think there's any better feeling than a well-executed plan, right? And that, you know, goes for both domains. So 
requirements, planning, execution, and iteration. Real quick in the chat, like I want to, I want you guys to, to look at this flow of data and tell me what you think, like, or what field you think that this this flow of data is like most likely attributed to? Like, is it engineering? Is it filmmaking? Is it is it something else? Is it you know cooking? Is it I don't know. Like, what what do you when you see this? What immediately comes to your head when you think about this flow of data? Let me see the chat. Let me see the chat. I don't think my chat is moving a little slow. I think my chat might be lagging, but it's all good. I'll keep it going. So, yeah, just continue to look at this and, and, and think, you know, what this this kind of attributes to, right? But I'm often asked, right, like, would I choose filmmaking or engineering, right? Like, people always ask me that, like, is it, if you had to choose, if you had to put it on your Libra scale, like, which one are you going to choose? And I tell them all the time, right? Like, why do I have to choose? Why not both, right? I'm actually doing both, but but literally, like, when you tell me that, I always reply, like, why not both, right? And, um, you know, this 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 flow of data, like, like a lot of people have said in the chat, like, is really applicable to anything, right? Requirements, planning, execution, and iteration, this is just how you build in general. This is how you create in general, right? And I'm just going to talk about, you know, two fields, obviously, filmmaking and, and engineering, you know, my preferred mediums, and kind of talk about, you know, how these things make sense and kind of draw parallels on these two as well. So on the right side, we have filmmaking, and on the left side, we have engineering, right? And before any creative venture, before any, you know, technical venture, right, planning is, is, is essential, right? Having your requirements down, having your plan is super important. And again, like it's not necessarily a must, but you know, why not? Why wouldn't we do this, right? Trying to, to just wing things are going to leave, leave you wingless. You're not going to be able to fly like that, right? So zooming in, I'm going to zoom in on this to the right right here. This is an application called Millinote, right? Um, this is um, actually my Millinote, personally. This is kind of how I take what's in my brain and put it down on paper as it pertains to actually kind of creating a film or creating some, some, any sort of video. This is just, you know, my way of structuring my thoughts, right? So we have the overall idea, the locations, I have the music, I have the scenes that I want to create, I have um, my storyboard, and I have my shot list, which is super important, right? This is just a way for me to to outline, you know, the different characters, again, the characters of my story, and the different pieces, the different settings, the different objects, and make it make sense, right? Put the pieces together. And I'm just going to scroll over to the left, right? And we have a software requirement specification, right? And again, I just want to note, this is not a doc from my work. This is something I found from the internet, so no one, you know, come come sue me or anything, right? Um, I just want to, so this is a, a, a software requirement specification. And, and ultimately, this is a way for us as engineers and people who build applications to have a, a clear description of, of what the software that we're building is supposed to do, right? What it's supposed to accomplish and ultimately how it's supposed to behave, right? And again, this isn't a must that you have this, but let's think about it. Why not? Like, why would we just try to wing it and just build blindly, right? Without kind of having a, a, a flow of idea or, or have a sort of a North Star to what we're building. Keeping it going, right? Oops, there we go. Keeping keeping this idea of, 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 of requirements and planning, right? I want to zoom in a little bit further, right? So I showed you sort of the top part of my Miller note, right? But this is, you know, a shot list that I, you know, I created for the scenes that I actually wanted to, to build up, right? This is a linear flow of data, right? In, in the technical terms, right? But ultimately, it's it's a logical sequence of events that allow me to stay on track with what I'm trying to build and what I'm trying to create ultimately, right? And again, every film doesn't need to have a shot list, but you know, why not? Like, think about it. Like, why wouldn't you want to have a, a, a way to kind of keep yourself on a line, keep yourself, you know, on track to the, your angles? Moving over to the left, right, we have sort of a, a an architectural diagram of, you know, your, your typical microservice, right? Again, this is a way for us to understand the flow of data, understand the flow of logic of the system that we're building and, how, and understand how things are ultimately connected at the end of the day how the structure makes sense, right? And again, like I said, you don't need this when you're building a system, but think about it, why wouldn't you, right? Why wouldn't you You have a, a way for you to, to understand how the data is gonna go from one system to the other? And ultimately this is, you know, if we're speaking uh, candidly, like this is gonna be able to help us identify problems easier and accurately, and more importantly, resolve them quickly, right? Knowing how things are um, connected with each other, we can kind of see where the bottlenecks are. And ultimately, it's just going to help us scale and deploy changes faster at the end of the day, right? Which is super important. Keeping it going, right? So we talked about requirements, we talked about planning. Now we got to talk about execution, right? And this is where the magic happens. So 
on the right, again, this is the film side, and left is the, is the um the uh, technical side. This is my editing. Uh, this is sort of screenshot of my editing. This is a wedding that I shot um a few few years ago. Um, shout out to my friend DJ and so on. If you guys are watching this, love y'all. Um, but again, this this is where the magic happens, right? This is a, a linear flow of data. If we zoom in a little bit further, right? This is a left to right flow of data, right? In the beginning over here, this is probably where the um the ceremony took place. You know, right here we're looking at the reception, and later on, you know, we had some after events for the for the after reception, right? It's a linear flow, a chronological sequence of events, right? And if we think about code on the left, but again, this is not code that I wrote at work. No one comes to me. This is you know something I, I wrote on my own. But right here, this is um a service that you know something I just built at home to basically take videos and transform them, transfer them into audio files, into audio MP3 files, right? And for an interpreted language like Python, right? Because this is written in Python, the, the the logical flow of data instead of going left to right like my editing software, it goes top down, right? Every line, each line by line is executed in a sequential order of events, right? This is how we execute. This is the linear flow of data, right? This is this is the ultimately this is the story that I'm telling through code line by line, right? And you know, I just wanted to, to take a note that we're talking about execution, right? Execution is very much so inclusive of testing. I, I couldn't tell you how many times I, I've made iterations of this, this video right here. So again, like when I when I approach a video, the first thing I do, right, is I, I get a bunch of different audio files, a bunch of different songs, and I just play them and listen to them, right? And I just play them while watching the clips that I shot, and I just think and I, and I see how I feel about this music and what I'm looking at and see if there is some sort of synergy between the two. Now, what does that look like? What does testing look like in, in engineering, right? Well, that looks like unit tests, right? That looks like integration tests. That looks like end-to-end -end tests, right? To kind of see how our code is going to be reactive to certain changes and making sure, again, that we're proactive and not reactive at the end of the day. Keeping the party going, right? Iteration, right? So we talked about we talked about requirements and planning. We talked about um, execution, but you know, iteration is again how we build robust stories. This is how we talk about attention and detail and craftsmanship, right? Um, for any creatives out there, right? This 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 name nomenclature, right? Is, is I know this is very familiar with you, right? You think you're done with the project, and then you go back and you have to make revisions, right? So this this name started off as final video. That was the name. Then I went back and I changed the final final promo video, final final promo video too. Like you know, iterations are over. It's the process of iterating over and over to make sure that you are ultimately telling the best story and putting out the best work and making sure that the, the application that you're building again is as robust as possible. Tying it back into, into engineering, right? This is the um, Git commit history of a Twitter bot that I built um, in 2020, right? Um, this is actually no longer working, all thanks to Mr. Musk, but nonetheless. And so just the overall idea of when I built this during the pandemic, right? This is, um, I wanted it to kind of serve as like my own news feed, sort of like a for you page, so to, so to speak, right? But a very you know, condensed version of a for you page. So I built it, it was working, it was cool. I was like, oh, this is dope. And then later on, I was like, I kind of want to add more to it. I wanted to do more things. I want to iterate and add new enhancements to it, right? I want to make it more robust and, and you know, something that more people can, can interact with, not just myself. So, you know, I had this great idea <laughs> where I would, um, uh, I would I would tweet it the hashtag SOTD, right? Which stands for song of the day. And it would go into my SoundCloud library and basically come back and, and send me a song, you know, every day, right? If I tweet it or if anyone tweeted, it, it'll, you know, reply with you, reply a song to you. And um, again, like iteration and revision is is, is key to, to any any story, right? That you're telling iteration and, and revision is key to any any application that you're building. This is an integral part of making sure that we're telling the best stories and making sure that our code tells the best stories at the same time, making sure that, you know, the story that we're telling are inclusive. The code that we're writing is inclusive when we think about the um, creation or really the boom of AI, right? Making sure that the data that we're using and how these AI powered, AI powered models and services are telling inclusive stories as well. So, you know, ultimately, right, like these two domains are, are different, right? Like they're different, yes, but you know, they, they, they really share the same thought process of, of gathering requirements, you know, planning, planning your, your line of attack, executing on that line of attack, testing it over and over and iterating it, you know, and, and, you know, really dotting your I's and crossing your T's until you kind of get to that sweet spot where you can actually put it out and let it be received by the world. Right. Keeping the party going. So 
we talked about a little bit about like, you know, just what I do, like, you know, at work, film, all these different things. But, you know, what does that actually look like for you, right? As a creative, as a, as a techie, as, you know, someone, you know, somewhere else in, the, in, in this middle ground or even on the, the, the highs and low point of this, right? Like, I want to kind of help you or, you know, really give you a five-step framework, what I consider as a way to kind of help you tell your own story, whether you're trying to level up, whether you're trying to break. And I think this is both applicable to both domains. So jumping straight into it, right? The first thing you want to do is paint a canvas of your skills. And what I mean by that, well, you need to make, you need to create a skills inventory, right? You need to take a bird's eye view of all the things that you have, both technical and non-technical, right? Like put it all on paper, make sure that you leave no, un, no, stone, no stone unturned, right? That you have a full understanding, a full map of, you know, where your skills lie, right? Skills reside. And, and once that, you want to then identify the key characters of your story. Right. And, and again, what do I mean by that? Well, you want to identify learning resources. Right. And learning you want you, you have the, you have an understanding of the gaps, you know, from your skills of where you are, where you want to be. But now you have to find ways to kind of fill in those gaps. Right. And what does those resources look like? Well, they look like coursework. It looks like school. It looks like um, YouTube, for example, it looks like articles. But it also looks like people. Right. These are people who can be integral in your story, people who have the knowledge that you're trying to. Um, acquire whether you're trying to go from mid level to senior or whether you're trying to just actually break in as well. Like, you have to identify resources that you know are specific to the things that you're trying to accomplish, you know, to help you build your technical acumen. Next, you want to actually, you know, craft your tail through projects, right? And what does that look like? It looks like selecting relevant projects, right? Like coursework and, and, and YouTube and even just talking to people, like I mentioned before, is fine, but it's not enough, right? You have to get your hands dirty, you have to put in the work at the end of the day. Like, this is, this is just the name of the game, right? You have to take your ideas and act upon it. Take your ideas and build it, right? And, you know, specifically as an engineer, um, like I mentioned a couple of slides ago, like I had a simple, you know, system that, you know, takes um, an audio, it takes a video file and, you know, spits out an MP3 file, right? Like that is inherently just a project, right? At the end of the day, it's not something that I'm giving out or making for the world. It's just something I made for me, right? You have to get your hands dirty. Next, you need to establish community in your story. And, you know, I'm super, you know, happy that you guys are all here for Test Given, right? Because, you know, that's ultimately the, the goal. That's ultimately ROI, right? And finding community, to be honest, I could have said establishing community could have been number one. It could have been one through five, to be honest, right? This is super important. I think it's almost the most important thing here because, you know, this is not a siloed effort, right? Like community is at the forefront of building anything, right? And, you know, that's why I'm super happy to meet you guys virtually and uh, in person as well, like to help you, not even help you, but like just, you know, be a part of your community. And I think it's, it's super important that one, we lean on people, but two, that we also be people that people can lean on. Like it's a two way street, right? Making sure that, you know, we don't lose sight of that. Um, and last but not least, you got to outline and document your story, right? Um, and what does that look like? Well, document your story looks like um, you know, just sharing your, your journey, right? And it doesn't have to be in public. It doesn't have to be a publicly outwardly saying like, this is what I'm doing. This is what's going on. But it's just a, a way for you to understand and track what you're doing and track the progress that you're going and making sure that, um, you know, you're not, you're taking inventory of where you started and, and understanding that you still are, are in line with where you're trying to go, right? For me, again, I give you some personal anecdote, right? Like I'm someone who, uh, was a computer science major in undergrad, but I didn't graduate computer science. You know, um, I had a really tough time in college, but I always knew where I wanted to go at the end of the day. And, you know, I kept not necessarily a a, a, a journal, but I kept a, a visual and I kept pieces or things in mind that helped me stay aligned and make sure that as I was progressing, that I knew that I was progressing and I could track my pro progress because I can look back at a you know history of things that I've done ultimately to kind of get me to where I am. So, you know, that's my five step framework, um, keeping it going and, and really just wrapping it up, right? Like for my my creatives, for my my engineers, you know, like, or even anyone that kind of falls in between or outside of that, right? Like, you know, our, wor our worlds are, you know, if you ask someone, they're inherently different, right? Well, people will think that they're different, right? But, you know, in reality, they're actually more similar than we give credit to, right? And um, I really just hope that, you know, you, you feel encouraged to, you know, consider your corporate work as a creative experience, right? And look at it through a creative lens, right? And and, and and take take more of a creative approach to it as well, right? Understanding that you're already building stories, right? As an engineer, again, you're already building stories, you're already telling narratives, right? But to kind of take a little bit more of a conscious approach to that and understand as you're building stories that you kind of, you know, continue to have attention to detail so that you're building stories and telling narratives ultimately that you'll be proud of, right? So 
that's my time. Thank you. And definitely want to make sure I get some time for, for questions, man. So talk to me. What's going on? How y'all feeling? Uh, it's moving a little slow on my end. There we go. So let me see. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, man, where's energy, man? I need some emojis. I need some, 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 drop your LinkedIn's in the chat, man. What's going on? Talk to me. I know it's early, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. But, yeah, man, let's see. Let's see. Okay, we got the, the music coming in. I like that. Hey. Hey. If I ain't got no questions, I'm going to just rock out. Hey. Ah, ah, ah. Yes, sir. Hmm. Oh man, yeah. Can we can we bring Femi back up here? Let's bring Femi back up real quick, man. I, I got a couple questions for him. Jeez. Yes, sir. So, so how you feeling, man? I'm good, bro. I feel good, man. Um again, like I'm honored, you know, to kind of be here to kind of speak with you all, man. I typically I'm in the background a lot. So, you know, being on the stage is, is definitely, you know, a blessing for me. And I'm super excited to, to be here. We happy to have you here too. So y'all, um, we gonna hashtag Femi in the front. I know that's a long hashtag, Femi in the front, because we need Femi in the front lines going forward. So just put that hashtag in there, Femi in the front. Um, hashtag that all over his Instagram, Femi, Femi in the front, because we need to give more presentations. Um, I learned a lot <laughs> today, my guy. I learned a lot. Um, but I want to know um, if you have, if, if you would answer a question or two for me. I do. There is a question in the chat. I'm looking at it right now. But oh, the yeah. question chat. Let me see. Um, let's let's answer the question. Let's prioritize the questions in the chat first, and then after that, we will. Um, I, I got like one for you. But um, so, question: Did you choose where you wanted to work because of your interest in music? How does working where you work fit into your story in your career journey? Okay, so I'm assuming she means my interest in, in filmmaking. In, in film, in filmmaking, yeah, filmmaking. Um, so I will say I didn't choose it because of that. I was actually, you know, I don't want to be too religious for anybody here, but I felt like it fell in my lap ultimately, right? Like I got reached out through LinkedIn and, um, you know, after the conversations, they were like, yeah, the, the role is specifically about the media supply chains, right? For or basically working on creating videos and managing video content. And I was just like, God is, you know, is that you like it, it just made sense for me, right? And I know that's not necessarily the story for everybody, but I would say like it really kind of like I reached out for the opportunity and I was just like, this just makes perfect sense. It was a nice way for me to marry the two things that I that I ultimately love and do, you know, into a way where like I don't necessarily feel that like um I have to like take off my creative lens when I'm at work, right? They they, they marry together. And a lot of times, you know, the uh the work that I'm doing and sort of even just the 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 the, the topics or the technical acumen, it kind of blurs and blends in together, right? Because I've done some of the work on my own, right? When we're talking about aspect ratios, creating videos of certain size or making sure to have certain audio, that's something that I do when I actually create videos. Now I'm just doing it in a technical sense through code, essentially. So to ultimately ask, um, answer your question, like it, I didn't choose it, it kind of just came to me, honestly. Um, but yeah, like I think, again, working here, like it has allowed me to have an appreciation of filmmaking from a, from a different lens, right? So now, again, like I approach my work through a creative lens and also I can approach my creative work through a technical lens, understand that they both, you know, talk to each other nicely. I love that. I love that. Great answer. There's another question. Um, how did you transition into software engineering without graduating with a degree in computer science? Yeah, man, that's a great question, actually. And, you know, if you want, I can, you can connect with me and I can tell you my entire story, but I will say that, um, so I actually, just to be very, very transparent, I actually failed out of computer science early on in undergrad, right? And I just remember um, there was a few of us, we kind of were all in this boat together, you know, shout out to my guys, because they're all doing well now as well. But, um, you know, I found another curriculum in school that had um, programming courses in it. And I was like, yo, I don't even know what this language is, but I'm gonna just take it because I know it's programming and I'm gonna just learn it, right? So ultimately taking that, that change of majors and taking, change, taking that, um, that major that had that coursework, I was able to land internships in college because of the programming work or pro the programming courses that I took. And ultimately those internships turned into um, fellowships, those fellowships turned into my first job. And then that job turned into my second job where I'm working at now. So I was able to kind of like in undergrad, find a way to, to see where the things that I wanted to do at the end of the day were still applicable to things that I'm like 
you know, capable of touching in school, right? Where in school, what options in school that I have can I take that'll still ultimately get me to the end goal? Love that. All right, so uh, I, I'm going. I'm going to have to to challenge you a little bit. Um, somebody said, "Tell us your failures in the chat." You do tell stories. Like, you tell your career stories as a storyteller. So we want to hear. The, what's, we want to hear what's it? Tell tell us your failures. Failures, man. Yep. Um, you know, I got I got one for sure, man. Um, you know, I, I and this is crazy. I remember this 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 project I was working, this is many years ago, maybe like 17, 18, I don't know. But um, I remember there was, um, I was working on a, a, a system, right? I was software engineer working on this 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 system. And I, I really thought I knew how to code. I, I thought I knew how to code back then, right? And, you know, I'm working on it and I'm struggling bad, like badly, bro. Like I'm, I'm behind on, on my deliverables, like, and I can see that like, you know, I'm not necessarily performing up to par. And I just remember, um, being moved to another team, that was really like the 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 rain cloud for me, right? That was like the moment I was like, nah, this this mm. this is not gonna work for me at all. And I just remember being on that team, you know, I was still coding, but I wasn't doing it to the level that I was doing it before. And I just remember like this is a true story. I remember um going to work and leaving work every day and just building projects every day. I would I would probably watch like 10 hours of YouTube. I would probably be, I think I bought like, you know. I'm not gonna say the dollar amount, but I bought so many courses and I would just build and build and build and build and build and build. And I was just like, you know, I can't let this happen again. Like that was, you know, kind of my coming to Jesus moment where I was like, this isn't gonna work. And I just remember building and building, building, building. And then ultimately I was just like, I got to a point where I was like, I know this now and I'm ready to take a next leap. And I ultimately went to the, I ultimately then started working a new job later on. So you know, I guess mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question, but like that was a, a, a big failure. I, mean, I think that was a pivotal moment in my career, kind of like understanding that what I thought I knew, I didn't really know well. And making sure that I, I again, built my skills in inventory, like I said before, and I, I mapped out what I had and what I was trying to do and found ways to, to, to kind of fill in that gap. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful point. Uh, Chabuzo said in the chat, um, failures equal opportunities. And I feel like you just laid that out perfectly as a story to the wood. Like, um, it's always an opportunity for you in this sense for you to say, oh, wow, okay, I don't know this as well as I think I do. And so you just went 10 toes down and developed those skills. And now you're yeah, able man. to, you know, do what you're doing today. So I think that that's always a thing. Always, uh, always stay learning and always stay humble. I think that's, that's, uh, two things that we could take away from that. Um, we're going to get one more question and then I believe we got to Yeah, we got to wrap it up. Yeah, I will um, say that you so, know, if anyone has any of the questions that I'm not able to answer, um, feel free. I'm see how I can share my contact, you know, maybe on LinkedIn. I'll post it in the chat so you can hit me directly if you need anything, if you just need some one-on-one -on -one time, or if you don't you know, want to ask your questions here as well. For sure. And let's just do it like that because uh, we are pretty much at time. So if you have any last words that you want to leave people with, uh, maybe it is LinkedIn or just last words you want to leave, leave people with, y'all can please contact them and slide to the DMs respectfully and we'll be good. Awesome, man. Oh, again, looking forward to meet you guys virtually and in person. So if you see me, say what's up. Um, but I'll drop my um, LinkedIn in the chat as well. So feel free to hit me up. So, hey, thank you so much, my guy. Y'all, please show some love. Let's get some claps in the chat for Femi. Let's get some claps in the chat for Femi. Uh, we're going to keep moving this show along here. Uh, but Femi, thank you so much for uh, giving us that bridging the gap between um, coding and storytelling. I hope those creatives uh, definitely got something from this. As a creative, I definitely learned a lot about tech through uh, seeing that. But um, what we're going to learn about right now, um, for those that are looking to get in the product or those that are already in product um, or those that are founders, when you have a product, right, uh, um, a product idea, what you first want to look at when you have a product idea before you start to build that thing out is, is it viable? Um, does it have potential to make an impact in the market? And once you realize that it has potential to make an impact in the market, then you want to figure, all right, so it has, it can make an impact, but how are we going to continue to grow this? How are we going to be able to scale?